said not to panic when we are talking about sexual reproduction all we're going to be talking about is um like the actual science not like health class don't freak out it's going to be nice and g-rated okay um but what we're really looking at is how you take this gene pool from the two parents it gets all shuffled around and some of those genetics get passed on to the offspring and so that's why you have siblings that have that are full siblings have the same mother and father but they have very different characteristics so if you look at like a litter of puppies or a litter of kittens you see some similarities but you also see some differences um, same with family members right you have siblings that are full brother and sister and you know they might look really similar where i could be like oh yeah you're related to so and so or that kind of thing but then they're not identical either like there's a lot of differences as well so it's all just kind of random and we'll get into that more um, in our last unit of the year which is genetics so our first slide for today is the idea of these variations these differences help allow certain organisms to survive better if their environment changes so we know environments and ecosystems aren't always going to stay the same. Things happen, right? Things could, could cause some major changes in an ecosystem. And so if you have diversity in the species, this is going to increase the likelihood that some of those individuals will be able to survive if the conditions change. So maybe the way the um, organism in, uh, the way the organism is, is great for the environment they're living in. But if something would happen, maybe like a flood or a fire or some kind of natural disaster, and it changes what's found there, it could definitely have a big effect. And so that's kind of what we're going to be talking about today. Think of, um, this is always my example, think of The Lion King. Everybody here has probably seen the movie The Lion King. And it's like, seriously, we're talking cartoons now? <laughs> so, The Lion King, if you think back, Uncle Scar, right? He was kind of that darker color fur, right? He was definitely different than most of the other lions. Um, Mufasa and Simba, they were both the, um, like the nice kind of what you would expect a lion to look like, the big golden, very strong, very powerful, right? And so that's your typical lion. That fit well with the pride that they were living in. They were big, they were strong, they were fast. That really helped them. Uncle Scar was kind of, he didn't seem as athletic, he didn't seem as strong, he had that darker fur. Um, and so, it's not that Scar was unhealthy, but he just didn't look as good. Like, he was surviving, but he wasn't thriving as much, I'd say, as Mufasa was, right? He was definitely, um, like, your prototypical, like, very powerful, strong lion. So, imagine now, that the pride gets burnt, like there's a huge forest fire, and it totally blackens the whole pride, right? So now where everything used to be nice and lush, and there was, you know, a lot of vegetation and stuff, now it's like all burnt, it's all kind of black and, and dirty from the ash. Well, guess which lion is now going to be better camouflaged to slink around? No, Uncle Scar, right? So in the original pride, his dark color and his kind of sleek body and him kind of being slinky, that didn't really help. Like he was okay, but it didn't, it wasn't a benefit to him. Now that the pride is burnt and it's dark and it's black, he is blended in. He's more camouflaged. So because the environment changed, now his dark fur is an advantage. So over generations, if he was able to thrive and survive and do better, Chances are he'd be able to reproduce, pass that dark fur trait on to offspring, and next thing you know, in maybe three or four generations, almost all the lions have dark fur. So maybe the lions aren't golden furred lions like we know today if they had grown up in a pride that was burnt and dark and black. All right, so that's kind of how sometimes species can change it over time. If the environment changes and now a certain trait or characteristic like that dark fur has become an advantage they're able to survive better they're able to pass that that it's not like they're choosing to pass that dark colored fur trait on but when they reproduce they do pass it on to a lot of them and then those those um, cubs are able to be more successful in that dark fur 
um, ecosystem as well. So it just kind of you know goes from one thing to another. And so we'll, that's kind of what this whole topic is about. Um, and so if something changes, now that characteristic becomes an advantage. So the idea of evolution involves the change of an inherited characteristic over time. That dark fur is now our characteristic that we're going to use for our example. And so this is considered to be a theory. Um, just like plate tectonics is a theory, there's a lot of proof, um, there's a lot of evidence, but it hasn't reached that category of a law yet. Just like the law of gravity, it's like everybody agrees, like we know gravity is a thing. Um, so evolution is like right there, like it's as close to being a law without being a law. So like it's still a huge idea in science. The majority of the scientific community believes in it. Um, and again, I'm not saying that I'm telling you that we evolved from apes. Um, that is not my job. But there, there, are, there are evidences that certain species, or most species, over time has changed. All right, and has evolved into what we now see today. Um, it's not like a species just all of a sudden got created out of nowhere. Okay. Um, so there is a lot of proof that evolution is a real thing. It's well supported. And it, is been, it has been tested, and there's lots of evidence. Um, but there are some people that will be like, you know, kind of fight the idea of humans evolving um, from a, a original species of something else, right? And again, a lot of people believe that that is true, and a lot of people believe that God created man. So those are our two main ideas, and that's not what we're going to be debating or talking about. But just... Just realize like usually people start thinking along those lines as we kind of cover this. But if we think of other species besides humans, you can see this is like um, what they believe the modern horse came from. So we can see that you know their bodies got taller, the legs got longer, um, they got you know a little bit thicker as they went, their hoofs became more developed. All right, so there are fossil remains that kind of point us in the direction that, okay, the modern horse has not always been the way we know it today. And so when you have a group of organisms that share similar characteristics and can reproduce to make fertile offspring, that puts something in a species. So something is going to stay a species until it changes enough that it can no longer reproduce to make fertile offspring. So like you can breed a horse and a donkey to get a mule, but mules are sterile and cannot make a mule. It takes a horse breeding to a donkey to make that mule. So yeah. Well, there are kinds of trivia in here. Okay, so Charles Darwin is like the granddaddy of them all, right? He is the main player and the main dude when it comes to evolution and adaptation and this idea of how organisms have evolved or changed over time. He has a super famous theory called survival of the fittest. And by fittest, I don't mean like the most athletic or the fastest or the most physically fit. What we mean by fittest, it's the organism that best fits into its environment. Uncle Scar now is better fit. He is more suited to fit into that burnt pride than he was when the pride was luscious and green and thriving. Right? He would need to be strong and fast to get his, you know, food. Now in the pride that's burnt, he's black and dark and slinking around, and he's able to get food better than the bright golden uh, Mufasa or Simba or typical lion. So he has now become more fit to survive in that new environment. And so it's kind of hard because I think that if you think about that, it makes sense. Like it's kind of like, well, yeah, like if you fit better, of course you're going to survive better. Well, somebody had to be the first one to think this up, kind of like poor Alfred Maggard. He was the first one that looked at the continents and were like, whoa, they look like they used to fit together like a perfect little puzzle, right? 
somebody has to be the original thinker. And so we take advantage of that thinking now, and it makes sense, but that's all hindsight. Like the first person to really look into this or the first couple people, people were kind of like, mm, I don't know about this, okay? So he wasn't like um, laughed at and like, it wasn't as bad as like what happened to Alfred Wenger. Um, but he had a lot more evidence, so people were like, ooh, okay, like they kind of picked up on his theory pretty quickly because he had a lot of proof. And we'll look at some of that. Okay, so Charles Darwin's theory of survival of the fittest, this is kind of how it came about. He went on this ship called the, Her, the HMS Beagle, which is Her Majesty's, I'm thinking ship, um, but it was a British ship. Um, and he went to just observe different plants and animals along the trip. So he wasn't a explorer, he wasn't a sailor, he was just there as a scientist, basically. Pretty much. So he observed a variety of animals and plants on the Galapagos Islands. I think I've told you that I got to go to the Galapagos Islands, right? No? So when I was in college, I was a biology major and I was a Spanish minor, and the biology and Spanish department went to Ecuador every other year and they went there for like three months. So it just happened to be like my junior year was the year that we made the trip. And so we got to go all over Ecuador for those three months. One of the places we got to go were the Galapagos Islands and we were there for two weeks and we were on, they called them yachts, but they were just like big boats that you could sleep on. And we got to go to the different islands and some of them are inhabited. Some of them you're just allowed to go and like you get off on a little dinghy and like you boat to it like a little canoe kind of thing and you can go and walk around. But they're all volcanic islands and they're really close off of the coast of Ecuador. And so they provide a really unique ecosystem and so we'll kind of get into that. Um, but I have a ton of pictures like it was um, like nowhere else you've ever been. Like one island was like a jungle one island is black beaches and like volcanic rock made the, the island. So it's all black, black sand. Um, and then you go to another island and it had like big rocks and, you know, little bushes and shrubs. Like, so the, all the islands were super, super different. So you think like a chain of islands that are pretty close together should all be about the same, but they all kind of developed and were isolated so much from the other islands that they had their own unique ecosystem and environment. And their age. Could be, yeah, yeah, that definitely, yeah, because they didn't all get like made from this lava all at once. Yeah, good point. Okay, so while he was um, on these islands, he observed 13 species of finches, which is a type of bird, and he noticed that they looked the same except for a couple features. They had um, different body sizes, different beak shapes, and different eating habits meaning they ate different things, their beaks were different shaped, and their bodies were, you know, a little bit different shaped. But he could tell that they were the same species, right? He also observed that they looked similar to the finches that he'd seen in Ecuador. So this led him to make an observation, ask a question, form a hypothesis, make a prediction, and do a test, right? Following that scientific method, um, not because that's the method you're supposed to follow, but just because it kind of logically made sense. So he made that observation, and that is how he got to form the hypothesis that these 13 species evolved from that original mainland finch. So it all came back to that one type of finch on the Ecuador South American continent. And then from there, some of them had to get to the other islands, and then they started to change once they were on that island. Okay, so he reasoned that members of each of these species had to compete for food, shelter, and other life necessities. That's the basic needs of all organisms, right? Now, obviously, humans are a little different because we have um, a lot higher level thinking, and so we are able to create habitats like we don't have to live outside in the cold. We've built houses to protect ourselves from the cold and from the heat. So when we're thinking about these species, um, you know, we're able to kind of bypass a lot of that and survive better than a lot of organisms, obviously. Um, but if you're thinking of just normal animals and plants, like they all have to have their basic needs met. And so if you have a species that is better able to do that with the resources that are around, logic will tell you they're going to be the ones that are the best fit for that environment 
they're going to be healthier, they're going to live longer, probably have a chance to reproduce and pass those genetic traits on to their offspring. Just like if Uncle Scar had a bunch of cubs, all the dark ones would be probably more successful because they're still matching that dark environment. Then that dark fur gets passed on to their offspring and their offspring, and as long as it stays black and burnt, they're going to be the dominant species, right? A version of their species. Yes? That probably wouldn't look good, right? No. No. Why do you think polar bears live in the Arctic? They match their best suited for that environment. A, a grizzly bear is going to stick out, right? Okay, so the members best able to survive will pass their strongest traits on to their offspring. This is all random. Like, they don't be like, oh, I know the dark fur is good. I'm going to give it to my babies. You can't do that, right? You can't make a decision on what gets passed on. But chances are that genetic information, that trait, will get passed on to at least some of the offspring, and those are the ones that are going to continue to do well, and then they'll have offspring. Those ones with that same good trait will continue to pass that on. And so that's how a species over time could turn where it's all lions with dark fur that are left. And so over time, these differences can result in an entirely different species. So maybe you would end up with a species of lion that's the dark fur, like Scar, and you'd have um, another species that was retained the golden light fur, um, or maybe they would just die out altogether, right? It's hard to tell. So sometimes a species that can't compete and gets so weak that it can't survive will just die out, become extinct. Um, and then it, the, the dark fur lions kind of go on their own path and become, you know, that's the, the new version of the species. Like rhinos. What about them? Lions? Yeah, like a subgroup. Mm, look that up. Tell me. No, not now. Write it down and look it up. Yeah, because I'd be curious about that. I hadn't heard about that. Oh, so we call this process survival of the fittest. Okay, again, not the most fit, like physically fit, or the most athletic, or the strongest, or the fastest but the one that is best fit for that environment. Because Scar wasn't the like most physically fit. Definitely Mufasa and Simba, their body types were the more prototypical lion, bigger, stronger, faster, but he was more fit for that new environment. Okay, so he, Charles Darwin recorded his thoughts in this book that he wrote called um, The Origin of Species. So like how do species get created? Like where do these changes come from? His theory is also known sometimes as natural selection. So nature is doing the selecting. It's not like I'm like, ooh, I want this pride to be all dark and black now. I'm going to try to weed out the blonde colored lions and I want all the dark furred ones to be the dominant species now. It's not like somebody chooses it. When it's natural selection, it's nature doing this, this, the selecting, right? We also have something called artificial selection. That's like what we do when we breed animals, right? We pick characteristics that we want in the offspring. We choose the two parents. We allow them to breed, and then we hope that we get those favorable characteristics in the offspring. That's what they're doing with all of these uh, mixed breed dogs, right? With the poodles being bred to um, to golden retrievers or to labs or to Burmese mountain dogs, right? You're getting the, the positive traits of the poodle and you're crossing them with those other breeds and you're getting some favorable traits that you're after or characteristics, right? We do the same thing with our horses. Like, we um, have certain characteristics in our stallion that we know we need to like cross up with certain mares and like hope that we have a good mind from the stallion and athleticism um, you know from the mare put it together and hopefully you get a good offspring right one that is athletic but is not too wound up and that can think and actually you know work and do their job right so it doesn't matter how fast they are if they can't function like they're too crazy right so um you know we're always kind of looking for you know what's the perfect match or like what crosses up well that's what we call artificial selection because we're choosing who we're putting together to mate natural selection like 
made his mate and you get these traits and characteristics and then nature like weeds out the ones that aren't able to live and aren't able to survive as good and so it's not anybody is really doing it's nature that is kind of weeding out the ones that are not going to make it so natural selection is where um, organisms with traits best suited to their environment are going to be more likely to survive And again, if you think about this, it's all logical. Like, it all makes sense. I think. Tell me if I'm wrong, I guess. Or, I like it when I'm right. Everybody likes to be right. All right. So, organisms produce more offspring that can survive. This is part of kind of the natural order of things. If you've ever had a litter of puppies or kittens, um, if there's ever been like uh, one that's born kind of deformed or like maybe with only three legs or missing an eye or like something like something sometimes there's genetic mistakes that go on in nature like if we're not there to help take care of like offspring in nature a lot of organisms would just die like if you there's a litter of puppies and one of them's born kind of messed up or deformed chances are it's not going to live long enough in the wild. Now, if we're there and we can help it and we're feeding it and doing all these different things, we can probably get it to survive possibly at least for a little bit. Um, maybe, maybe not. It just depends on how, like, what the deformity or what the issue is. Um, but in nature, like, we know, like, things are going to happen. There's predators. Um, there's lack of resources. So there's natural disasters that come and might wipe out a litter or you know, some, some babies of whatever the species is. And so we get it, like, there's more born than are expected to live. And it's kind of sad, but it's, it's just kind of, you know, we call it natural selection. Like, the weaker are going to have less of a chance to survive. And so if they're weaker, they probably have poor traits, and those poor traits are less likely to get passed on because they're probably not going to make it to reproduce themselves. And so, you know, some of those bad characteristics can kind of get weeded out or not passed along, which makes the species in the long run stronger. Um, but it's when you have variations and variety among species that if an environment changes, you have the possibility of at least that species going on. So, like, if there were no dark furred lions at all and the, the pride got burnt, right, well, maybe those bright golden lions weren't going to be king of the jungles anymore. They aren't going to be able to be able to sneak around and, you know, get their food and be able to survive as good. And so over time, they might get weaker and weaker, and they might not survive, you know, after a few generations. But those dark furred ones, now is their time to shine, right? They fit right in. They can continue the species while the golden ones die out. Harsh, but it's the laws of nature. So some variations can be helpful. And so if the variation that an organism has is helpful to its environment, we call those, um, we, we say that those variations are called adaptations. That dark fur, because now it's a benefit, becomes an adaptation, right? So any, like that fur wasn't bad, it wasn't good before. But once that forest fire came through, now, the dark fur is a, is a good thing, and so it becomes an adaptation. And so over time, the offspring of individuals with these helpful variations end up making up more of the population and eventually become separate species. Again, this is not like one or two generations. This might be, you know, four, five, six, seven generations. So it's kind of a long-term process. Um, it doesn't always happen just, just like that. Yes? I know you like, like number of animals you have to create in your species? I don't think there's a set number. It's basically when they have separated enough that they can just breed within their species and not outside of it. So it can be a small population. Um, that's a good question, but there isn't like a set number. It's just have they changed enough from the species that they evolved from or, you know, that they started from. Okay, so these variations... Um, we call them inherited traits that make an individual different from other members of its species. So look at those dogs, right? It's all one species. They're very different. 
right? They all have some similarities. They all have the same organs. They have four legs, two ears, two eyes, a nose, right? They have a lot of things, a tail, whether it's a stubby one or a long one, right? You have a lot of similarities, but there's a lot of differences as well. You have a little chihuahua that can like fit in your hand and then you have a Great Dane that is like 150 or 60 pounds, right? So you have a huge difference um, in those. And so all of those characteristics that make a certain type of dog like what they are, those are, you know, pretty unique. They can still breed, which is why they are considered the same species. So, um, you know, that's why the poodle can cross with a lab, even though they look pretty different, they're still a dog. They're still the same species. Yes. Oh, okay, sorry. All right, so sometimes these can result in permanent changes in an organism's genes. So if, and like hypothetically, <laughs> if all the lions that kept surviving were the dark furred ones after the fire and the golden ones basically were dying out, that dark fur could become a permanent change if they're the only ones that are able to survive. And so sometimes um, these can be like very simply like hairlines, fruit with or without seeds. So I kind of get stuck a lot of times talking about animals, but this is true for plants as well. All right, so these, these differences um, can be for plants too. And this is how we get new species. And this is constantly happening, right? Evolution is still going on, even though it's a slow process, it's still going on. All around us. Sometimes it can take thousands or maybe even millions of years for a species to totally separate itself out from you know what it, it began from. So maybe the golden lions hang on for thousands of years before they eventually die out. All right, now here's a big thing. If a variation becomes a benefit, that's when adaptations, that's when it be, is a variation that is now an adaptation. So not all, adapt, not all variations are adaptations because not all change, like differences and characteristics are a benefit. But if it is a benefit, we call that a special type of variation, which is an adaptation. All right, so we're giving you lots of vocab terms today. So the adaptations are any variation that makes the organism better suited for the environment. It means it can fit and live in that and be more successful, be healthier, be stronger, be more able to get food and then be able to better reproduce and then better to create offspring that can then pass those traits on to their offspring. Um, so here's some examples. Color camouflage, just like dark furred Uncle Scar. You can see like the little cheetah in there. This is actually a moth or a butterfly right in there with the, the leaves. I know, such good camouflage, right? It's amazing. Even the shape. Um, so if you've ever seen, and I think it might be on your notes, like the walking stick, stick. yeah, the stick bug. <laughs> they look just like a stick, so the shape of them. You know, it just blends right in. It's pretty cool. Um, the giraffe neck. So the way that the giraffe neck is supposedly has evolved is you had like short neck giraffes. And there was like a couple random ones that had longer necks. Well, they were able to reach the leaves higher in the trees that the ones down here couldn't reach. It was like golden corral all the time for them. Nobody else could reach the high leaves except for those few long neck giraffes. So they could eat all the, all the time. And so that means they got bigger and they got stronger and then they were more healthy. And so then when they reproduced, they would pass that long neck gene on to their offspring. So over time, when you got more and more with the long neck, the shorter neck ones started dying out. And that's how the giraffe now came to be the way we know it with the long neck. Oh, there it is, the walking stick bug. Um, there's also something called behavioral adaptations, which we won't talk about as much in here this year, um, but like migrating and hibernating and things like that, the um, instinct to hunt and things like that 
chemical makeup, um, like chameleons, change color, and that's a chemical change that takes place um, as they change color to adapt to what they're around. They can also produce a bad smell, like the skunk or even like stick bugs, right? Taste bad. So like if a, um, if like the stink bugs, like the little ladybugs, they look like ladybugs, like birds aren't gonna wanna get them. Cause if you've ever gotten that, picked them up and you accidentally like taste like your finger afterwards, they taste as bitter as they smell. Yeah. I ate a stink bug. Ew. 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 Wait, accident. Accident. Okay, I'm glad you put that I in there. Right. I need put that. I, I was right on my eyes. So anyways, certain bugs do have a bitter, nasty, sorry, thank you, a bitter, nasty taste to them. And so the birds that are hunting for insects to eat, they see it and they're like, ooh, those are the nasty ones. And so they stay away from them. That's a fantastic natural defense that those bugs have. Okay, so if a variation does not help an organism survive, then it's just a regular old variation. It's just a difference. But if it is helpful, that's when it changes category and it becomes an adaptation. Again, kind of makes sense. If it's just good, it's an adaptation. If it's, you know, doesn't hurt them, doesn't help them, it's just a difference then you're dealing with just a variation. <coughs> All right, so if an environment doesn't change, then the organism doesn't need to change either. So like Uncle Scar with the brown dark fur, it's not an advantage or an adaptation until the environment changed. So if the environment never changed, that brown fur never becomes an adaptation. It's just a regular old variation. It's not really hurting him. It's not really helping him either. All right, so here's just a few examples. Um, beavers have a lot of really unique um, adaptations. They have these really long incisors that never stop growing, which is why they're always chewing. Otherwise, their teeth would just like end up growing in, like up and down and like going into their head. Um, so that's why um, they're always chewing. They have nostrils um, and ears that can close. So like there's like little flaps that just like close so they don't get water going up their nose and into their ears. Um, they also have a flap that goes kind of at the back of their throat in a way so that when they're carrying a stick in their mouth, like if we were trying to have our mouth open, water would like we'd kind of be gagging and choking, right? So they have this little flap that closes. That's pretty unique. They also have their big flapper tail and they use that to like make those scary, intimidating like slapping noises. So they seem more intimidating and scary um, than they really are. They don't have a whole lot of defense, uh, but that scares some of the predators away.